But we are going to start at this embassy. The embassy, uh, this one is a, a big one. It is fully staffed. It has a lot of different directorates. There is, for example, a whole division of cultural affairs. They've got multiple military attaches. They've got a Navy attache, an Air Force attache. They've got a drug enforcement attache. They've got a law enforcement attache. Uh, they've got the people who run consular affairs, which is like, you know, folks getting visas and stuff. Uh, there's even, in this embassy, there's even an attache specifically for fish. The fisheries attaché uh, is named uh, Mr. Oleg Vladimirovich Rykov. So if you are a, a Russian fish <laughs> with a problem that needs fixing by your government, Oleg is your man in D.C., the fish minister. Um, but if your issue is economic in nature, you should know that this embassy, which is the Russian embassy in D.C., the economic section of the Russian embassy, recently got a new guy put in charge of the economic section. And the new guy at the economic section was brought in under some clouds of suspicion concerning the old guy. The old guy who got shipped out last summer, his name is Mikhail uh, Kalugin. Kalugin? Forgive me. My Russian pronunciation is as good as my fashion sense. I'm sure I'm butchering it, but it looks to me like Kalugin. Now, it's important to, the reason I'm stressing that, it's important to know how his name is spelled. Because if you don't spell his name right, that creates a little bit of a Google problem around this story. Because when this guy, when this guy, the head of the economic section at the Russian embassy in Washington, D.C., when he turned up in that sketchy, uncorroborated dossier of alleged Russian dirt on Donald Trump, his name was misspelled in the dossier. Uh, they flopped a couple of the vowels around, so he was spelled Kuligin instead of Kalugin. And so, if, like me, you set Google News alerts on names that popped up in that dossier, that created a problem for following the story because the name was misspelled in the dossier. Other than that misspelling, though, which screwed up my research for days, <laughs> other than the misspelling, the reference in the dossier actually made sense. He was described in the dossier as a high-ranking Russian diplomat in Washington. And the reference to him was a really important one. So this is from page 22 of the sketchy dossier. It says this, quote, Senior Russian diplomat withdrawn from Washington Embassy on account of potential exposure in U.S. presidential election operations. Uh, and then on the following page, it elaborates, quote, as a prophylactic measure, a leading Russian diplomat, Mikhail Kuligin, he means Kalugin, um, Mikhail, the head of the economic section at the embassy, quote, was withdrawn from Washington on short notice because Moscow feared his heavy involvement in the U.S. election operation, including the so-called veterans' pensions ruse reported previously, um, his heavy involvement in the U.S. election operation would be exposed in the media. So... This senior Russian diplomat working at the Russian embassy, he gets taken out of the embassy. He gets withdrawn from the embassy in Washington. He gets recalled to Moscow, allegedly on account of him being exposable, him potentially being exposed for his role in the Russian operation against our presidential election. Okay, now that, that reference to the pension ruse reported previously, that's a reference to the alleged means by which the Russian government paid for this operation, right? That did actually have to pay for it, right? It's about the way they got cash to pay hackers and other operatives to do the grunt labor of this Russian election attack. I mean, what we know of the Russian attack on our election, Russian efforts to try to elect Donald Trump president, it did not seem to be a super labor intensive process. It wasn't like an industrial process, but you do need people to do the work. You do need, for example, people building and running the online bots and repeaters, right, that were, you know, giving ginned up fake viral status to negative news and, about Hillary Clinton and, and positive news about Donald Trump, right? So, I mean, you do actually have to involve some people and you probably do have to pay some folks. So the allegation here from the dossier was that this guy working in a very senior position at the Russian embassy, he was basically the paymaster for this operation. And the allegation from the dossier is that he was withdrawn from the embassy, withdrawn from the Russian embassy in Washington, sent back to Moscow on short notice because the Russians were worried that he was going to be exposed, right? that he was a risk. It seems like their idea, if this proves out, was that if there was ever going to be a real, Rus a real investigation into what Russia did here, 
this guy in this, you know, high-ranking position at the embassy with this important role, sort of a centralized role in the scheme, he was just kind of too big a breadcrumb, right, to leave out there for investigators. And so they had to get him back to Moscow, get him out of Washington. So that part of the dossier was dated September 14th last year. And, you know, you have heard me say it, you have heard everybody say it. This is an uncorroborated dossier. It is a sheaf of unproven allegations, and some of those allegations are too lurid to make even veiled jokes about them on basic cable. But you know what? Not all of it is just lurid stuff of a personal nature. This guy from the embassy, Mikhail Kalugin, he really did get called home from the Russian embassy in D.C. in August. And now he really is back in Moscow. McClatchy has had some really good reporters on this beat in recent weeks. They found this embassy guy in Moscow. They got him to do sort of an angry short email interview with them. He denied everything. He called it all fake news. But look, two people with knowledge of a multi-agency U.S. investigation into the Kremlin's meddling in the presidential election have told us that indeed Mikhail Kalugin was under scrutiny when he departed. So, you know, honestly, none of us really know, sort of holistically, what to think about this dossier. But here's one concrete, checkable part of it. This guy really did work as a senior diplomat in the Russian embassy in D.C., and he really did get summoned back to Moscow while nobody expected him to, reportedly while U.S. investigators were examining his potential role in this scheme by the Russian government to mess up our election. That's in the dossier. That seems to have happened in real life. At least the checkable parts of it have. He had served in the embassy apparently for six years, but then yank. And, and of course, you know, he denies having any role in this scheme. All the Russians deny that there even was such a scheme. And it's possible that he was yanked this past summer just as a part of a normal rotation. It was time for him to go. It's also possible that the Russians felt like they needed to get him out. And think about their reasoning behind that. Right, because he was a senior diplomat at their embassy. They didn't have to worry about any criminal liability for him, right? He would have diplomatic immunity. He's a senior diplomat serving in the embassy. No matter what the U.S. might have ever wanted to charge him with, he'd have immunity. I mean, if he was, theoretically, the paymaster for foreign agents hacking into the Democratic Party and under otherwise undermining America's presidential election, and that was found to be a crime in this country, he couldn't be convicted of that in the United States because of his diplomatic immunity. They wouldn't have to worry about him being personally liable if he was involved in this. Now that he's back in Moscow, well, there's two implications of that, right? Two consequences of that. Now that he's back in Moscow and he's no longer in D.C., if there were ever criminal charges brought against him, conveniently, Russia does not have an extradition treaty, right? So they've got the Right? They've got immunity for him as a diplomatic official in the United States. Back home in Russia, they don't have to extradite anybody to the United States. So in terms of his personal liability, protecting him, in no sense is he in any sort of danger, right? In no sense is he looking at any sort of personal liability in this matter, even if he did what he is alleged to have done. But there's another implication to bringing him back to Moscow, right? There's one very clear advantage for the Russians in bringing him back to Moscow. If this guy did have a key role in running this operation against our presidential election, well, as long as he's in Moscow, he's outside the grasp of U.S. investigators. Right? It's not just that you can't extradite him. You can't, you know, subpoena him. You can't ask him to come to Congress. He's out of the way. He's in Moscow. He's out of reach. And that may be is the most important thing for our purposes as U.S. citizens here, right? We're all trying to figure out what's just happened to our country. You know, what's going on with this incredible national security scandal that looms over our new presidency? How are we going to get to the bottom of this thing? Right? What's most important to all of us about this is that if this guy did have a key role in that scheme, while he is in Moscow, he is out of reach of U.S. investigators. And who are the U.S. investigators? Right? In terms of the investigation into what happened here. Something really important happened today that is not heartening at all. We all know the basic history of this dossier, right? Now, reportedly, it had circulated around Washington. It had circulated among some journalists late last year. I never saw it before it was published. I had heard rumors about some of the things in it, but I am not one of the people who saw it, and I don't know many people who say they did see it before BuzzFeed published it. But it was apparently out there. In early January, it was reported by CNN that the FBI briefed Donald Trump and briefed President Obama on a list of allegations against Donald Trump 
and his campaign concerning Russia. That initial report from CNN didn't exactly say what these allegations were, but within 24 hours, BuzzFeed News published the dossier, this whole 35-page dossier. And there was a huge uproar at the time. Everybody, including BuzzFeed, admitted the dossier was all uncorroborated information. But you know what? It didn't end there. And that ends up being really important for what happened today. Because quietly, over the next few weeks after this thing was published by BuzzFeed, to such an uproar, there have been multiple reports that some of the information in this dossier is bearing out under further investigation. This thing didn't just get published and then go away. U.S. investigators have been looking into this. And bits and pieces of what's reported in this dossier are turning out to be true and reported and checkable. I mean, there is this mysterious recall to Moscow of the economic section chief for the Russian embassy in D.C. And McClatchy reporting that when he left, yes, he was under investigation for his potential role in this Russian operation against our election. Okay. There's also a report from CNN recently and from The New Yorker last week that we highlighted just the other night on this show. Look, headline. U.S. investigators corroborate some aspects of the Russia dossier. Quote, intercepts do confirm that some of the conversations described in the dossier took place between the same individuals on the same days and from the same locations as detailed in the dossier. Quote, corroboration based on intercepted communications has given U.S. intelligence and law enforcement greater confidence in the credibility of some aspects of the dossier. And here's an intelligence official speaking to The New Yorker. Quote, they are continuing to chase down stuff from the dossier, and at its core, a lot of it is bearing out. Okay. Well, if parts of this dossier are bearing out, if investigators are finding that the specific allegations, specific conversations, describe specific anecdotes, at least some of them check out when they double-check this work. Well, it's maybe worth focusing again on what the point of this is on what the bottom line is of this dossier, particularly given what happened today in London. Because forget all of the salacious personal stuff. Forget all the stuff that made the White House so mad when this was published, right? The bottom line of this dossier, the bottom line allegation, the point of it is that the Trump campaign didn't just benefit from Russia interfering in our presidential campaign. The point of this is they colluded, they helped, they were in on it. Right? The money quote from this dossier is, the operation had been conducted with the full knowledge of Trump and senior members of his campaign team. That's basically what this whole dossier alleges, that the Trump folks were in on it. They were, there were multiple people close to Trump, involved in the Trump campaign, who were in contact with the Russian government about the Russian government's attacks on Hillary Clinton while those attacks were happening, while Russia was waging these attacks. And Overall, yes, we still have to describe this as a sheaf of uncorroborated allegations, but little pieces supporting that bottom line thesis really do keep falling in line, right? I mean, think about what we've learned just in the last few weeks. Michael Flynn resigning, right? Buried in the revelations about National Security Advisor Michael Flynn resigning, right? Him having contact with the Russian government that he did not own up to and lying about what the content was of his communications. Buried in those revelations was not just the fact that he talked to the Russian government during the transition, but he also had multiple contacts with the Russian government during the campaign, right? During the campaign. What was he talking to them about during the campaign when the Russians were hacking our election? Explicitly referenced in the dossier is a meeting by Trump campaign foreign policy advisor Carter Page. A meeting between him and a very senior Russian official in July 2016. Not only has the Trump campaign now admitted that that meeting happened, today a Trump campaign official confirmed to Politico.com that not only did that meeting happen in Moscow, but the Trump campaign explicitly authorized Carter Page to go to Moscow and take that meeting at the time. That's just confirmed by the Trump campaign today. Wednesday night last week, the New York Times reported that the British and the Dutch, American allies, including the British and the Dutch, have given information to U.S. investigators about not just intercepted communications, but in-person meetings during the presidential campaign between people close to Vladimir Putin, including Russian government officials, and people close to Trump. They were allegedly holding in-person meetings in European cities, and European intelligence agencies reported on those meetings to the U.S. They reported on those meetings between Trump folks and Putin folks during the campaign. 
And that, that news, fairly explosive news, from the New York Times, that was last Wednesday night. It was overshadowed in the news cycle because a couple hours after the New York Times posted that article, the Washington Post broke the news that Attorney General Jeff Sessions himself had taken at least two meetings with Russian government officials that he had not disclosed even when he was asked about it under oath during his confirmation hearings. And so, yeah, it's understandable that those earlier allegations from earlier in the evening got overshadowed, but, you know, the Sessions thing, how's that resolving? That led to, you know, a whole big drama that continues today about Sessions recusing himself as attorney general, recusing himself from overseeing any of the investigations into the Trump campaign and its contacts with Russia. But once again, we're sort of in this situation with this story in particular and the Trump administration in general, where it's sort of best to Treat it like a silent movie a little bit. Ignore the personal stuff. Ignore all the kinetic fighting about this stuff in Washington, right? Get back to the main point here. Right? Get back to the big point here. Get back to the like, you know, challenging the fate of the republic stuff here, right? The main allegation here, the thing everybody is most worried about, which is the bottom line allegation of this unproven dossier, is that Russia didn't just attack our election. They did so with the knowledge of and support of the Trump campaign that the Trump folks were in on it, that they knew what Russia was doing while they were doing it, and they continued meeting with Russians in knowledge of that activity during the time of the attack. So yeah, the Jeff Sessions drama and the recusal questions are interesting and will continuing to, can continue to be newsworthy. But look at the meeting that gave rise to the recusal, right? That meeting with Jeff Sessions and the Russian guy happened September 8th. What did they talk about? I mean, these were the headlines that week, right? This is the Washington Post. The start of that week. U.S. investigating potential covert Russian plan to disrupt November elections. This was the biggest story in the country that week. And that's when Jeff Sessions took his meeting with a Russian government official. Hmm, did they talk about the biggest story in the country that week, which was about the Russian government and the Trump campaign, as they took that meeting as a representative of the Russian government and the Trump campaign? Right, the, remember the bottom line here, the allegation here, the bottom line allegation here, the worst case scenario is collusion, that the Trump folks were in on it, that they were in communication with the Russians about this while the Russians were doing it. And yeah, Sessions is recused. You still got an open question as to whether there will be an independent investigation. Today was the confirmation hearing of the man nominated to be deputy attorney general. Sessions has recused himself from the Trump-Russia investigations. It would be this deputy attorney general, if he's confirmed, to be, uh, who would be overseeing what we're told are several ongoing Justice Department investigations into links between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Uh, the nominee, Rod Rosenstein, today would not commit to, handling the, to handing those duties off to an independent special prosecutor, even though if he decides to do this himself, that puts him in a weird position, right? I mean, if he decides he's going to personally oversee these investigations, It'll not just be him investigating the Trump campaign that just appointed him to this high position. It'll be him overseeing an investigation into his own boss, Jeff Sessions, since Sessions personally is implicated. Sessions himself is implicated in this story, and the timeline of his Russian contacts needs explaining as part of any looking into this. Right, so the independence of the FBI investigations, the Justice Department investigations, right? If you're worried about the FBI investigations and the other DOJ investigations here, if you're worried that those may not cut the mustard in terms of aggression and independence, well, what are the other investigations? There's these intelligence committees in Congress, right, that are also leading investigations. One of them in the House, headed by a Trump campaign transition official, <laughs> who just announced today that they will hold uh, their first public hearing on this issue on March 20th. The other investigation in the Senate is headed by a member of the National Security Advisory Committee to the Donald Trump campaign. Right. But that brings us to the shooting star that went off in this story today. NBC News reported last week on the day Sessions recused himself on Thursday. NBC reported on the basis of two sources that that Senate Intelligence Committee headed by Richard Burr, who was part of the Trump campaign, NBC reported that that committee was interested in talking to the author of the dossier. The author of the dossier, the former MI6 officer who prepared this sheaf of information, first for private clients and then reportedly who brought it to the FBI himself in the summer of last year when he was so disturbed by what he found, by what he concluded about collusion between the Trump folks and the Russians. Again, what he found was evidence, what he says he found was evidence not just of Russia attacking the U.S. presidential election, but one party in that election, the Trump campaign, helping, going along with it, colluding, being part of it. And that is way worse allegation than just the Russians attacking our election, right? 
or the Trump campaign having inexplicable contacts with Russians that they keep forgetting. The allegation of collusion is very, 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 very serious. Right? I mean, it's sort of as serious as it gets. It's a whole different ballgame than there's something mysterious here. Follow the money. Right? And, and again, the allegations in this dossier, we have to continue to describe them as uncorroborated. But toward the basic thesis of this dossier, that the Trump campaign was in on it, little pieces of that, little checkable pieces of that have been falling into place almost every day now. And clearly, the author of this dossier thought that he was onto something, thought that he had seen in action and he was proving that that collusion was underway and he was so disturbed by it that he took it to the FBI. And NBC reported on Thursday that the Senate Intelligence Committee wants to call him personally to testify about this. Until, and until today, that was all academic. Interesting, but academic. Because, of course, the author of this dossier famously went into hiding as soon as BuzzFeed published this document in January. But you know what happened today in London? He's alive. Look, there he is. He's back. He's no longer in hiding. Christopher Steele, the author of the dossier, made himself known publicly today. He says he's going back to work at his intelligence firm and he doesn't want to answer any questions. Okay, well, number one, it answers some questions. Number one, this means he's alive. Number two, he's well and capable of speaking. Number three, he made sure to appear by video. So presumably people who recognize him can recognize him and back up the fact that that really is him. He really has surfaced. Does this mean, though, that we as American citizens are finally going to get access to what he knows? That we're finally going to get to hear what backs this up? Is the Senate Intelligence Committee going to call him and have him testify like NBC News reported late last week? Well. We called the Senate Intelligence Committee tonight, and they told us, no, probably not. Press secretary to the top Democrat on the Senate Intelligence Committee tonight told us, quote, it is not at all likely, at least not at this moment. Christopher Steele is back. He's alive. He's out there. You guys investigating this want to talk to him? I mean, so far, it is us as American citizens, it is us in the press who are connecting the dots on this story, who are figuring this out. Do we have any reason to believe that any government official investigation into this scandal is, is doing the same? Honestly, it's a DOJ controlled by a Trump campaign official, or it's two intelligence committees, each controlled by a Trump campaign official. Support your free press. It is really starting to feel like we're going to have to do this ourselves. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.